It's a great pleasure to introduce again uh, Ernesto Lopez of Roxin, the staff, who is going to deliver today his second distinguished uh, lecture on stringy motives. Ernesto? Uh, thank you so much. I'm again very honored to be here. And uh, today I will be continuing uh, with the second talk. Uh, it's a continuation from yesterday's talk. And today, uh, the title is Extreme Motives. Uh, and most of I, uh, what I will say today is joint work with Tomaso de Fornex, Thomas Nevins, and Bernardo Uribe. Uh, so, uh, while well, this is the plan for the talk, uh, first I will be continuing uh, with these remarks about uh, analyzing the situation from four before that are the quotient of a manifold. Uh, 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 by a finite group into the more general case of the lead non first stack more generally. And uh, uh, so this is just to go from M mod G to the more general case in which we have a group of it. Then uh, we will uh, we will go to the very important concept for us that will be the the basic unifying concept. It will be the loop groupoids. This is the groupoid. Then uh, the loop groupoids uh, will correspond will give me the loop uh, stack, the loop orbifold of the orbifolds. This will be a, a, and then finally, uh, I will be talking about more, more particularly about um, motives. And uh, well, stringy motives. Let me call it stringy motivic integration. So that. These are the three main subjects today. And so let me start uh, uh, moving on. So this is, um, well, I, as I just said, so far, uh, everything I said, uh, more or less, uh, was considering this particular kind of orbifold, given by a manifold, acted on by a finite group. This is a so-called global quotient, global quotient. But as we know, as, as, as we uh, explained yesterday, there are orbifolds that are not global quotients, but only locally so. Uh, every orbit will be locally like this, but maybe not globally like this. Uh, so the way to deal with this is to think of them as the lead mount for facts. Uh, orbifolds as DM stacks. And one way to do that uh, in practice is to set up an atlas, uh, a group point. Uh, so uh, we have this many full of objects, this many full of morphisms. And then we have a multiplication of arrows of morphisms inverse of an arrow, the third of an arrow, and the target of an arrow, and the identity arrow. Uh, so uh, we are to think of them uh, as they could be manifolds, they could be varieties, or they could be schemes. And then the corresponding maps, uh, the manifold cases could be C, all of them could be C infinity maps. In that case, this would be a legal point. And um, uh, this would be an atlas. This would be an atlas for the orbifold, for the general orbifold. That is not necessarily, uh, of course, the global case is M cross G and M, this is the global coefficient case. 
course. So, uh, and then we can uh, see how the uh, Seagull localization principle for uh, equivariant key theory looks for orbifold key theory. Uh, we have these uh, source and target maps, and we have the meaningful of objects, uh, a vector orbit bundle. Uh, it's a vector bundle over the set of objects together with a cycle, an isomorphism, a given isomorphism uh, between these two bundles. And this is, in the global quotient case, is the notion of equivariant vector bundle. This generalizes the, the notion of equivariant vector bundle. And it defines the, the, the orbit vector bundles over the orbifolds, and then the orbifold case here. In any case, uh, we generalize the equivariant theory doesn't depend on the particular atlas or groupoid that you chose for your orbifold or the lead mount for the stack. And uh, so that's the way you go to the general orbifold, at least in the, for the K-theory situation. Now, uh, uh, so uh, that answers that, that question from last time. And now uh, we would like to uh, Think of the uh, uh, theory. And so, uh, I will consider the simplest possible quantum field theory, and that is the theory of the Laplace. Uh, today, I will consider the Laplace. If I had a, if I had a third thought. I would consider it square roots, the Dirac operator. But today I will consider the Laplace, and uh, 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 let's consider a Riemannian metric on M, and then with uh, the Laplace from K forms. On K forms. Uh, and then uh, uh, this Laplace. Is the, the operator uh, associated to the Euler Lagrange equation uh, that uh, for a quantum field theory whose fields, the fields of this quantum field theory, are, uh, interval, are maps from intervals uh, uh, from, sorry, from the circle to M. Uh, so, uh, we have that this is a quantum field theory of fields where the fields are uh, mapped from S1 to M. You may want to think of them as the infinity maps. It doesn't really matter uh, for now. <laughs> and so these are the fields of the quantum field theory. And uh, the Lagrangian, then the Lagrangian has to go from fields to the real number, but the fields, remember, were the loops on the manifold. It's called the free loop space. And, uh, and this is the Lagrangian. Lagrangian uh, well, because I'm using the curvy L for loops, I will use the straight L for the Lagrangian. And this Lagrangian must take a loop and give me a number. And because we have a Romanian metric, we have this notion of the length. And we can define this Lagrangian function. Uh, so, uh, now, all the information of the approach quantum theory is contained in this classical example in the spectrum of the Laplace. This, uh, so, the theory whose fields are L of M and whose Lagrangian is this one, uh, the information of the theory is contained in the spectrum of the operator, the classical quantum field theory, and this is the spectrum of the Laplace. So, uh, uh, recovering the classical theory from the quantum theory is the story uh, recovering the manifold from the spectrum of the Laplacian 
is the story of hearing the shape of a drum. Of a drum. Uh, you can do it, you can't, there is counter example, but this is that story. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Feynman uh, functional integration approach, uh, uh, the Feynman functional integration approach for this here allows to compute an integral over the free loop space of the manifolds by stationary space approximation as an integral over M. And remember that M is inside. In this case, is the fields of the theory. These are the fields of the theory. And these are the constant loops. So uh, if we want to do a, a Feynman integral over the fields of the theory, this is a Feynman integral of the space of loops of the manifold. And sometimes we can approximate by an integral just over M, because uh, just like the classical Feynman integral, we can do a stationary phase approximation sometimes. So by stationary phase approximation, we can go and compute this integral approximately as an integral over the manifold. And sometimes the approximation is exact. Uh, so that the, uh, the stationary phase approximation to computing the integrals, the expectation values of the theory. So, uh, uh, and of course, as I said, the quantum formalism is related to the heat equation. Uh, this is the, the flow of this quantum theory uh, under weak rotation, I did, under weak rotation. This is the flow of the quantum theory, it's the heat flow uh, for K forms. And uh, uh, the fundamental solution for the trace of the heat kernels. This is the, we compute the trace of the heat kernels, so super trace actually, but anyway, it can be thought of as the trace. Uh, well, this gives me the desired uh, Feynman integral. This is the simplest possible quantum field theory. Uh, here, uh, 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 this is a formal part of the binar measure of the loop over the loop space. And uh, well, it turns out that the sum of the traces of the heat kernels is independent. Of the, here we seem to have a dependent dependence. This appears. Um, and the long term limit. Of these sums equals the Euler characteristic. Equals the Euler characteristic. And so we are back to this Euler characteristic. All this story tells me that the partition function, this Feynman integral, gives me the Euler characteristic. Dependence gives me the Euler characteristic. So I, can I hear the Euler characteristic of the manifold from the from the spectrum of the operator. Yes, I can hear, I can compute the Euler characteristic from the spectrum of the operator. So this integral on the one hand gives me the Euler characteristic and project infinity. Uh, the short, short time behavior is given by the integral of a curvature expression. And this, uh, this story is, um, uh, well, uh, sorry, commercial expression. And, and here is a commercial expression. Uh, the dimension of the manifold is two. Uh, this Feynman integral, on the one hand, this is a Feynman in the integral over the loop space uh, that I just cut here of e to the e to the minus one L of p d phi. That where phi is a loop, uh, 
and it gives me in the uh, t plus infinity gives me the other characteristic, but in the short term limit gives me the integral of the Gaussian curvature, and this recovers the gauss bonnet theorem. So this recovers the gauss bonnet theorem. Uh, just taking this Feynman integral, this uh, quantum field theory, and taking the two limits for this expression. So uh, this is how one recovers the gauss bonnet theorem. Suppose that I would want to come to the gauss bonnet theorem for the false. Could I do it using the method of Feynman integral? Well, I need to carry out the program L of X. It's object. What should be the loop space, the loop of orbitals of an orbital is not going to be space, it's going to be an infinite dimensional orbital. Anyway, I should just mention something I will not really do in this talk, but it will be the third talk. Uh, we can do better than uh, comparing the Euler characteristic. We could get uh, a hat minus, and we could get a leap by the exact same thing. With some Feynman inverse. Of course, the other characteristic. So by changing uh, a little bit the situation, by doing variations on this calculation, I could go to the A hat genus and get the singer in the formula rather than the Gauss bonnet theorem. Or a corresponding expression for the elliptic genus. Um, so, uh, uh, if we put a, but we need, of course, to put a spin structure on the manifold. Uh, and then we can get the index of the Dirac operator rather than the Gauss bonnet formula. Uh, but, uh, but of course, uh, we want to go from a manifold to an orbifold and see, and then we need the object, which is the main object where we will integrate. Is where we will integrate. So this is we need space. Uh, so well, uh, we need loop orbitals. But to try to apply this method to an orbital, we must be able to say. What is the can candidate to replace the loop space of a manifold? Uh, and um, well, uh, Bernard Uribe uh, and I uh, worked this out. Uh, well, as I said, the idea is we, we consider a group of uh, that it represents an atlas for the orbifold, and then we need to associate a loop. Group That will be an atlas for the loop orbital. Uh, this takes the place for the three loop space of M, and where we can do this all this in Feynman integration. Uh, well, uh, 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 the, of course, uh, the, the calculation that I explained before for the Feynman integration for the Euler characteristic is a rigorous one, yeah, and we use this linear measure. Uh, it can be made rigorous for the uh, Yasinger index theorem using some probability measures. Uh, Bismuth, uh, Gatzler, people did this. Uh, I don't think, I'm not exactly sure, but I don't think it has been made rigorous, but it could be made rigorous for the Lipidinus. Perhaps, I'm not for sure, this has been difficult. Uh, uh, but so far, everything is rigorous. And uh, and there is no, everything is mathematical so far. Just a reminder. In any case, uh, if we get the loop point, or loop point, uh, we, could, we could try to apply this classifying the spice is functor. Uh, and uh, well, it turns out that we proved uh, 
uh, Uribe Hikotenka and I, that this is a homotopy equivalent to the free loop space of the classifying space functor on the groupoid for the orbit. Uh, the classifying space functor for the uh, orbit. Uh, and uh, so this, uh, well, it is good. It allows to use uh, classical algebraic topology, homotopy theory, etc., for a, a classical homotopy theory to study its topology. But they were more interested in its geometry than in its topology. So this is just a remark. In any case, doing this one can do the so-called orbital string topology. But in the global case, uh, uh, the, what is the model? What is the model? Uh, so in the global case, the loop group point. So the group point is this is a group point source and target in the global case. Uh, so the group point in the global case is S of mg is m, and P of mg is mg. And uh, uh, so what are going to be the objects of the loop group point? Well, the objects of the loop group point are going to be uh, uh, all these PGs, the, the jointing of all these PGs, where PG are the loops of holonomy G. Uh, and by, uh, what I mean by this is that if I have this, yeah, here's this orbital orbit uh, orbit chart, and here, divided by G, and here I have a loop, But here I lift the loop and I could lift it, uh, and it has holonomy G. Then uh, consider this pair of the loop above uh, together with the G, the holonomy, and this is uh, the set of all those is PG. And I separate, uh, I separate right, connected components. Well, these are the connected components. And this uh, this a topological space, the compact open topology, and uh, this is uh, well the object of the loop group points. In the uh, it's much more complicated, of course, in the non-global quotient case, but it can be done. And Uribe and I did it. Uh, it's also not impossible by any means. Uh, so. Uh, the space of arrows, well, what is going to be the space of arrows? Well, we're going to just take uh, the space of objects, it's infinite dimensional topological space, and we're going to act key, and then we have to give you what is the source and what is the target uh, to produce the loop group points. So, uh, well, let's take a typical arrow in the and I'll tell you what is the source. This is the source. This is the source, and this is the target. This loop, this loop that above. I'm I'm looking at the picture above in the, in the above orbit chart. Goes from x to xv. Uh, now acted on by h goes to x h, but to x h h minus one g h. Uh, uh, so notice that, um, uh, well, notice this conjugation. Uh, and uh, and this is the initial point. This is the initial point. So this is the initial point, but I'm something. This is the holonomy, G. And here the holonomy is H minus one G H. So H sends a loop of holonomy G to a loop of holonomy as by conjugation on the holonomy. G acts by conjugation in holonomy. 
economy. Here, uh, and this is what a, uh, this is what a loop looks like, and this is what an arrow in the loop group is. This is an arrow in the loop group is. It's an infinite dimensional link group it, it has a fetched structure. And uh, well, uh, uh, now we have perhaps the main theorem in the talk today. This is the main theorem in the in today's talk. An amusing theorem. Uh, uh, so this is the orbifold localization principle. So if we have an orbifold, and uh, we have its loop orbifolds. We have a manifold. An LM is this free loop space manifold. It's an infinite dimensional manifold as well. Uh, well, I can uh, I can rotate the loops. Uh, if C is a loop here, uh, well, I can act by Z on V. Uh, I'm taking this unit circle it's, it's com uh, complex numbers of modulo one uh, and then Z W. This gives me a circle action on the loop space, rotating the loops. It gives me a circle action on the loop space. Rotating the loops. And now I can take the, the fixed points of the that is where I want to localize in Feynman integrals. And this is the original manifold. The constant loops, the original manifold is inside the manifold as its constant loops, loops that are constant, not from S1 to M that are constant. Well, but something slightly different happens for an orbifold. If I take an orbifold and I take it to loop orbifolds, Well, I can also make the circle rotate the loops, and I can try to take the fixed stack of the loop stack. And you may expect or, uh, naively at first that this may be the original stack, but it is not. Something else is something that contains the original stack, the original orbifolds. But uh, it's so called the uh, inertia. It has very several names the inertia stack or default, also known as the twisted sectors. And this is the reason this localization principle theorem is the reason why the twisted sectors appear in all these quantum field theories. We're integrating over the loop space, we're integrating over the loop space of the orbifolds, some Feynman integral. But then by a stationary phase approximation, we realize that is the integral over the, well, not x, now the, the, station, the uh, integral. Uh, localized to the inertia, to the twisted vectors. And not to X. So the localization goes to the twisted vector. Because we are, a, well, is a invariant part of the circle action. Uh, so what is this inertia stack anyway? Well, it's a void. It has as its objects, uh, all the uh, uh, arrows that, like this, that go from one object to itself. These are the objects of this inertia, or the automorphisms of the original stack. And the arrows, well, are all the arrows in the original stack, the original orbital, that conjugate. Uh, well, there are loops of are not really, it's not really X, it's a little bit bigger than X. It's a, it's a tiny loop space. It's a loop space. It's a loop space 
of time loops. Uh, infinitesimal loops. Uh, well, Bernardo and I decided to call them ghost loops. So it's not only the inertia orbifolds, it's twisted vectors, but then I give it a third name, the ghost loop loops, loops of the orbifolds. Uh, it contains X, but it contains more. Um, so, uh, while for a manifold, we have the, 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 the manifold is inside the loop space as it's circular with variant loops, constant loops. In contrast, for an orbifold, we have that the circle invariant are the inertia, the twisted sectors. And therefore, we take the Euler characteristic, the K theory, and so on to localize to I of X the twisted sectors rather than to the orbifolds. And uh, the orbifold I of X is called in the mathematical literature the inertia orbifold of X. And it is, as Sherman Runcat pointed out, and is reflected in their terminology, the classical geometrical manifestation of the twisted sectors. And I say classical geometrical manifestation because a little bit unfair to call it twisted sectors. Twisted sectors are a quantum concept. They are sectors in the, in the Hilbert space of the state of a quantum field theory. Uh, these, these are geometrical objects. This I of X is a geometrical object. But this geometrical object uh, uh, corresponds uh, when, when you can hear the shape of the drum, when you can recover the classical space from the quantum, uh, from the spectrum of the quantum operator, corresponds to exactly the inertia orbital. So uh, uh, the two sectors are the, the sectors in the Hilbert space and, or in the spectrum of the corresponding operator. And this is the, the geometrical object that corresponds. Uh, so, uh, in run decided to call them the twisted sectors. Uh, but uh, there's a, a slight difference there. There's a quantization from here to the twisted sectors of Dixon, Harvey, Papa, and Whitney. Uh, uh, well, and as I just said, because this is uh, somehow uh, a tiny ghost loop space of tiny loops, it is uh, it's justified somehow to refer to invariants associated with this, such as the orbifold Euler characteristic, the stringy. Yeah, because it's this tiny work really completing the Euler characteristic of this tiny ghost loop space. Not of the in the space, but of this tiny ghost loop space that resolves the singularities. This tiny ghost loop space. Yeah. Indeed, we have for a general orbital what I just said. And so it's this Euler characteristic that solved the problem of the 17. Uh, Two-dimensional crystallographic groups uh, is uh, well, it's strange. Uh, and notice that the figure localization formula written in this language tells me that the equivariant K theory localizes to the non-equivariant K theory of the tiny loop space of the cost loop space. So the equivariant K theory. Uh, localizes to the uh, non covariant key theory of the cost loop space. Um, so, this is the Seagull localization formula from last time. In the general case, uh, where uh, X is not a, necessarily a global quotient. Um, so, uh, for, nevertheless, for global quotients, uh, where X is M mod C, one can verify that one has this very explicit expression. It's an easier expression than what I just wrote before with the arrows and whatnot. In the case in which you have this uh, global quotient, well, it's just the, the fixed points by the, the various conjugacy classes. 
and these are the central lights. And so uh, this gives you an expression for this tiny loop space, just in the classical language of motion space, motion stack, global coercion orifices. Well, and applied to this particular situation, this recovers exactly the trivial localization formula and the orifice oil characteristic from the previous talk. About goes loops, uh, to justify that, uh, that terminology, we prove the following theorem. Uh, so remember, remember that the classifying space of the loop, uh, loop uh, orbifold of an orbifold, classical loop space of the classifying space of the orbifold, the commute. So we prove this. Uh, and because this is the case, uh, we may wonder, well, uh, here it contains the classifying space of the small loops, the, the inertia. And we may wonder what lands here. Uh, and what lands here is the following. Uh, uh, so we have here, uh, the classifying space of the orbifold, that is the space that I defined yesterday. And here we have the quotient space of the orbifold. And above each point, the so-called fiber here will be the classifying, classical classifying space of the stabilizer of the action. This is the stabilizer here on this point. And here we have the classifying space of the stabilizer. And suppose that we have a loop. Gamma. That lands only on fibers. Never does this. It does not do this. It does not do this. No. It just stays within a fiber. It can do anything it wants on a fiber. Here on this inside here. So well, I, uh, uh, I call this LS of the X, and this will be well uh, uh, LS of the X will be well. This is a space, and this will be a subspace of L of the X. It will be the loop that lands on the fibers of this map. Uh, it will be the set of, uh, no, no, it will, this will be the set of such loops that land on a fiber and never go, go about different fibers. Uh, and then, uh, well, then we have proved the results. <laughs> We have proved that uh, this is the classified space of the inertia stack. So in this, these are these loops. It's a union of loops. Theoretically, it's a union of loops in all the classified space of the stabilizers of all the points. Uh, so this is a classified space of the inertia of the twisted vectors. Uh, so the, and the quantization, and the quantization, well, the quantization consists in putting here, yeah, doing geometric quantization to, to that space. And the quantization is the twisted vectors of the physicist. Uh, kind of part of the Hilbert twisted vector of the Okay, uh, well, so the correct Euler characteristic is stringy, as I just mentioned before. Now, uh, uh, so let me let me move to a classical example. Uh, now I'm going to consider all before that are classical examples. I have a little note in the chat. It says, uh, yes, it's great. So we have a uh, uh, now we consider some examples, some orbifold that is very classical. 
So let's take the finite group of ethyl to Z, a Z, ethyl to Z. And it's, uh, let's take a Kleinian uh, quotient similarity. Uh, so in the second half of the 90s, and took time classified the possible group, either cyclic, dihedral, or binary dihedral, we have equations for the similarities in C3. And I will concentrate moreover on a very small particular family, AR minus one singularities. And they correspond to just the cyclic group of order R. That's already an interesting example. So you take the cyclic group of order R and uh, well, we have this equation in C3 for this orbifold singularity. And in parametric form, we can make x equals to u to the r, uh, y equals to v to the r, and z equals to uv. And then, uh, and then, well, we can take a resolution of similarities. And we have this external divisor. And the incidence graph is ar minus 1. That's why they are called ar minus 1 singularity. So this is very classic. Uh, well, uh, now, g, the group g, uh, well, one can see these things in those different ways as the series of an equation like b, or the quotient by a group. And the group g has r minus 1 non trivial and reducible representations. And this is the so called Mackay correspondence. The number of the irreducible representations, in fact, a graph of the reducible representations will recover the incident graph of the exceptional device of the resolution of the singularity, in the famous Mackay correspondence. Uh, but let's just consider, uh, concentrate today on the number. We can do a little bit better later on. And we just take, well, the, the components of the exceptional divisor correspond to the irreducible representations of the group. And it's a very interesting statement. It's the so the Mackay correspondence. The Mackay correspondence establishes a one to one correspondence between the number of components of the exceptional divisor and a minimal resolution of the singularity uh, in a, and the number of non trivial reducible representations of G. So uh, notice that in this example, the orbifold Euler characteristic of the, uh, of the quotient by G uh, is uh, X is M mod G. So there is two things going on here. There is X equals M mod G, and there is the resolution. Uh, and of course, X can be thought of as a stack, the normal before, or as a variety. There's two ways of thinking of X. And in this particular situation, you can recover all the information of the stack from the variety and all the reformation of the variety from the stack. And, uh, and uh, but then there is a resolution. And so what is, uh, how does the stack? The stringy geometry, the stretchy geometry, the orbifold geometry here relates to the geometry of the resolution. Well, the Euler characteristic, the stringy or orbifold characteristic, is the Euler characteristic of Y. This is uh, the same statement as the Mackay correspondence. Uh, and uh, the exact resolution. Similarities. Okay, uh, but think of this example. Uh, so, how can one, how do one prove this? Well, there's many ways to prove this with, with calculations, and whatnot. But we want to do a conceptual proof of using the Feynman integrals. So, uh, one may expect uh, that some functional Feynman integral argument uh, may be provided to prove the Mackay correspondence. Uh, and yes, indeed, it's what we will do today. Uh, sorry, though, it is uh, the so called motivic integration. This is a rigorous version of the localized functional integration of Feynman. It, algebraic geometry discovered by Maxim Konsevich and it's known as motivic integration. And uh, well, let me out what do I know. Given a smooth complex variety, uh, uh, this is most one can define it arc space J of X. And J of X is meant to be thought of J 
quality of Y sorry, is mentally thought of as inside the loop space of Y. And it's also going to be yeah, tiny loops, tiny loops, extended tiny holomorphic disks to tiny holomorphic disks. So uh, we have these tiny holomorphic disks and we think of it, their boundary values, they are tiny loops. So well, uh, uh, well, uh, but we form a scheme with all of them, that is the, the key points of the scheme are given by this. Uh, uh, and this is the formal disk, so they are tiny. This is the formal disk. We think of the boundary of this little formal disk, given these tiny loops. And then uh, the scheme is obtained at the inverse limit of the jet. Okay, this is sorry. Uh, so we take the jet, we call the jet. Uh, and now, uh, and now, uh, well, we, we have this morphism between the various jet states given by truncation. We're going to use these morphisms to form an inverse limit. And so, uh, well, now let's think of uh, Y. And remember the example, I was resolving the singularity of X and there was an exceptional divisor. And so we think of the uh, a divisor and we're going to take the, the divisor as, the, as, the, as giving me a function to integrate. Uh, so the divisor, I'm going to think of all the loops in the uh, tiny loops around the divisor, and I'm going to integrate just around this tiny loop space, localizing the integral just around that tiny loop space. So, uh, uh, well, to each arc, we associate the order of contact along the divisor. You know? We have the tiny holomorphic disk. We think of how it, uh, its order of contact along the divisor. And this gives me, uh, well, this integral valid, integral valid function. And we want to integrate these functions in some reasonable things. Uh, again, uh, we are integrating along this tiny loop space, tiny loop space, and really along the divisor. Uh, and, uh, well, I need to tell you, uh, what algebra of measure of these functions and the measure to define the integral that I want to perform, there is going to be a rigorous version of the geometry of the Feynman integral. Well, uh, well the first uh, we get the algebra, the algebra of measurable sets will be the algebra of cylinder sets in J of X. So they are inverse images of constructible sets, not at all the final limit of this inverse system in the jet spaces. So we take this, we take constructible sets on the jet spaces, and then we take the inverse image in J of X, and these are called cylinder sets. And so uh, these are the sets that we're going to, uh, the algebra of X for my measure, but uh, the value of the measure will occur on the so-called not ring. So the, the value of the measure will occur on the metric ring. Uh, and I will need, I want to do the, my motivic ring relative to X. Remember we were above X. So I want to take varieties above X. Where I want to do it relative to X. And well, as I will explain soon. So, uh, we construct the motivic ring with a complex variety. We assume that Y is a wide variety. And, uh, and then we do uh, K naught bar X is the ring generated by isomorphism classes of X variety subject to the relation. B, class of B here, is the, uh, B minus W plus W for every, uh, for every W that is a closed variety. Uh, uh, X variety, I should have put here X variety of the X variety. 
It's two varieties, the egg variety. And in the plot, the final, you would expect that the fiber product over X, we take the fiber product over X to define the product in the ring. And then, well, the empty set over X is, identity, is a zero, and the identity is just X over X with the identity map. And now uh, we take this ring and then we invert L of X, uh, where this is just uh, L of X, just uh, A1 cross X, if you want to think about it like that. And uh, we invert that, uh, that L of X. Uh, so, and uh, now, uh, we do, and you can ignore this last step for now. We do, uh, we compete by a dimension filtration. The obvious dimension filtration, we compete the, the ring by that dimension filtration. And finally, we get the place where my uh, measure is going to be valued. This is not a ring, M hat. Uh, so, the competition average sub variety. Of the jet scheme of x, I think of y was living over x. But now I had, I have all these jet schemes of y. Well, composed to y and then to x, and then all the jet schemes can be thought of as x varieties. And uh, now finally we can define the most big measure of a cylinder set uh, by we fix a large enough integer so that. C is the inverse image of a constructible set. Remember, they were the inverse image of a constructible set. Some of these jet spaces to level. And then we define the motivic measure as the, the class in the ring of these, these constructible set times L to the minus seven dimension of Y. And this uh, uh, X cross A1, this dimension. And remember that we inverted L. In this ring. And so that's finally the measure of a, of a, uh, of a cylinder set and a constructible set, essentially. And then, uh, well, now we can do the motivic integral of this function. We want to integrate over the jet space, over this tiny loop space, we want to integrate this function. And uh, well, in our example, if we have this divisor that is given by simple uh, normal crossing. Uh, well, we we do this stratification, the obvious stratification, and the motivic integral then is given by this, is the uh, summing of uh, motivic measures. But well, the final answer is this is the motivic integral by the over this measure of this function. That is an integer. I'm taking the, all these integers and I am uh, taking this stratification and then I'm dividing by sets that whose measure is well-defined and then I'm adding them up. And, uh, and this, the obvious meaning of this integral, well, after doing the calculation, this is the answer given the stratification of the simple normal crossing device. So this is pretty much standard. Now, uh, the power of this series is the change of variable formula. Let me describe very quickly the formula. Uh, I will need, uh, can I take five more minutes on my time? Well, uh, so this is the, the change of variable formula. Uh, uh, for any effective divisor, uh, I, Pull it back. This is the thing that I want to change the variable from y to y prime. I pull it back and I add the relative canonical divisor. Uh, so I have this and I did this with a, a relative canonical divisor. Uh, then I can, I have a formula of this sort that tells me how to compute the integral on one to the integral on the other side. This is a formula due to concavity. And this can be extended to singular varieties. I, 
I use the scratch dissipation for smooth varieties, but it's a bit kind of similar varieties. One has to twist change the measure a little bit, and it's called the Gorenstein measure, but it can be done. So, what is the matrix matrix correspondence? Uh, well, I will have to do another localization of my ring to do the matrix matrix correspondence. Uh, with multiple localization to the sectors. Uh, I will have to do the, the uh, one extra localization uh, uh, that I will identify X varieties become isomorphic after some etal base change uh, on a three row classification. So I will identify varieties that under a tal base change, and I will localize that, and I will get the motivic ring, the tal motivic ring. It's a very reasonable thing to do. If I want to do the Lindman vertex. It's a very reasonable thing to do, and then I get the ring. Okay, uh, if X is a point, we're not changing anything. This is a usual motivic ring. Ed means nothing if X is a point. Now, well, Anyway, uh, let's take uh, global quotient orbifolds and uh, assume that X is Gorenstein. We can find resolution singularities with relative canonical divisor having simple normal crossings. And uh, this is our theorem. It says that the motivic integral this, over this tiny loop space, over this jet space, is, well, this is, the, uh, this is the, nearly the definition of the motivic integral. This is the definition, say, of the motivic integral. And this is the theorem. It localizes to the twisted sectors. And this W is the so-called ages of G that I will not describe in detail, that was first defined by, by Chen and Ruan. So uh, this uh, tells me that the, the, in, the motivic integral localizes to the twisted sector. And the change of variable formula tells me that is a good by rational invariant. So now I have everything uh, that I wanted. The correct, the correct invariants for by rational geometry are the stringy invariants. I'll explain this in a little. For example, the orbital Euler characteristic. Well, the orbital Euler characteristic, uh, you have the Euler characteristic just from the motivic ring Z. And, uh, uh, and when you do the motivic integral that corresponds to this integral of the heat kernel quantum theory that I explained, but in this rigorous setting, what you will get is a classical Mackay correspondent that I will just describe. For Kreppen's resolutions, this proves that the Euler characteristic of the orbifold, the orbifold Euler characteristic, the string invariant, is the Euler characteristic of the resolution. This would not be true for the ordinary Euler characteristic of the orbifold. It is only true for the stringy Euler characteristic, the orbifold Euler characteristic. Uh, well, I will skip most steps of the proof. The proof is here. You will be able to see it in the transparencies. And so uh, this is the proof of the theorem. I will just uh, say very quickly that this. This, uh, uh, rather than do it Euler characteristic, I can do the relative Euler characteristic, the Euler characteristic at every fiber of the map, relative, because all, manifold, uh, all varieties lived over X, they we have the relative situation. And when I do that, if I compute the Euler characteristic at every point of X of the inverse image, I get a constructible function on X. Uh, and this constructible function on X, uh, using uh, 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 McPherson's natural transformation, this constructible function of X, uh, well, I can apply the same argument and it localizes the twisted sectors, the integral of this construct, the motivic integral of this constructible function, the left hand side, will localize just to the twisted sectors. And uh, I apply McPherson's uh, group homomorphism from constructible functions to the show group. Then I, uh, this is a, uh, if I apply function one, I get the 
uh, George McPherson uh, current class. But if I apply this function that I compared computing Euler characteristics, I get the uh, uh, string return class. Uh, and our theorem is that the string return class uh, is a theorem, is our theorem, that the string return class localizes to the twisted sectors because the ordinary Schwarz McPherson class of the twisted sectors localizes to the inertia stack, not to the stack. So this is the string return class of X. And unlike the Schwarz McPherson return class, which is not a good birational invariant, the string return class is a good birational invariant. And so the string invariance, this localization principle tells you which invariant will be good for birational geometry. And sorry for running over time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto, for the wonderful lectures. So I have the following question. Uh, so are these uh, um, integrals based on motivic um, Integration in this intervals as uh, um, invariance based on motivic inter uh, integration that you are defining. Do they have uh, a utility property under blow up? How do they behave? Yeah, yeah. How do they behave under blow up from all these invariants? Do you add them up or? Well, you no, know, this is the best that I can say. Last this is the best that I can say. This is, say, the, we have this. Orbifolds and this other orbifold, and then you blow up and you have a common par partial resolution. But say it why is smooth? But I have a, what I'm asking is about something much simpler. I mean, let's say that I blow up a point. Uh -huh. So, how do this uh, invariants like this chain classes uh, behave? I mean, do, uh, do they have some additivity property or? Well, uh, if uh, you can say something, but it's uh, it's not terribly elegant. Uh, no, it's not an additivity property. It's uh, it's again, you know, you can uh, you can compute the between the you can give a formula for variant here in terms of the variant here. It would be a complicated formula in general if you know something like PEP, and, uh, if you understand the relative canonical divisor, you will be able to tell what the invariant is here in terms of the invariant here, in terms of the motivic uh, It will depend very much on the situation. Uh, but if they are K equivalent, if they are K equivalent, the invariant will be really an invariant of K equivalent. Equivalence here only means, of course, that yeah. Now, in a particular case, one would have to compute a little bit of a combinatorial calculation. Often, not very hard. Would tell you what the invariant from one above the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? When you define this new invariant, so may I ask you why you need this space change condition? So you need to modify this ring to this uh, kx at tau, something like yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, because uh, yeah. you know. I am motivated by, uh, because I really would like uh, I, I, I like the, I like this term to be true. Let me tell you. I would like this term to be true. This term to be true. Uh, yeah. I would like this term to be true. Uh, it's just yeah. true if I don't do that. But I would yeah. like this. I would like that the, the summation of the twisted of the classes of the twisted sectors. It's exactly the most weak interest given by the exceptional divisor. Yeah, yeah. It's false if I don't do that. 
the, but as I say here, but as I say here, uh, notice that, uh, uh, well, I don't expect this identity to hold. Uh, notice that, as I say here, uh, uh, this, this is the right thing to do. It doesn't realize very much. It still recovers all the information from the structural function, for example. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So it doesn't realize the ring too much, and it's the right ring to do for the Lin Monfort stacks. Our paper, we construct a motivic ring for the Lin Monfort stack. Of course, there is this etal drop condition in the group point. And it comes from this etal condition from the Lin Monfort stack. Okay, see. So uh, the ring doesn't change very much, and it's the right ring to consider if you are taking the link for it. We do lots of details in the papers. Uh, I didn't say which papers are these, but, you know, but these are the papers uh, by the Fernex. Yeah. Um, uh, Nevins. Uribe and myself. I see, I see. And also, it's likely more general for the Hodge structures is the Mina Kodar and myself. But, I see. but, but this is, a, we do the one for the Delin Monfort stack, and then this ring is the right one to consider for the variety. Mm -hmm. And the token you can come from the Talit in the Delin Monfort stack. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Ernesto. And uh, the next uh, talk of distinguished lecture series will be announced soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.